is a, this is proof right here, guys. If you're watching well, this, you will not meet nicer people. Whoop, I'm gonna point up the right <laughs> there and there. Uh, you will not meet nicer people. Be coming back to a show that I dearly love and admire. So thanks for having me. It's like that's Big Starklighter's homie. So how did you know? Because <laughs> I'm a nerd. I've placed information vital to the survival of the rebellion into the memory systems of this <laughs> two unit. But, you know, I mean, I was doing my research, and Wedge was obviously a character that you had to use right. if you were going to do Rogue Squadrons. What are you but doing, C-3PO? I'm taking one last look at my friends. <laughs> These aren't your friends. Cassie and Jim on the beach, and people are like, no. You can, I can literally hear people like, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> They, it doesn't look like they're not even hungry when they get out. They're not just like, did you bring a, a Snickers yeah. or something? <laughs> There's no logic to it. And then later, when we haven't even talked about the Wilfred Brimley of it all. I'm honored to be here. I'm also impressed that you got Zach Galifianakis as a guest tonight. Because <laughs> Darth Vader was the scariest thing that had ever happened to anybody. And this guy literally looks like the devil. You? Don't do that. There is no track. <laughs> What's the big question? people have like what's the thing everybody's wondering about what's the thing i don't understand what would i want to hear the galaxy isn't growing to push people out it's growing to let more people come in and find their love so that it's able to continue and create this connective tissue it's good to know that people still love it out there and that the people who made it are all mm -hmm. uh, proud and passionate about it and willing to come back it was a mess dude i had to wear a patch for a bit we went to see star wars that night because i said no i'm going we have to go and i went to see star wars with a huge thing on my eye <laughs> i i like yeah. to denote people as daddies from time to time um okay. and i believe that you are a certified daddy like pedro pascal's a daddy like, right. you know yeah certified daddy I have had the best time ever on Around the Galaxy. Thank you so much. Well, welcome to Around the Galaxy, the Star Wars fan talk show, part of the streaming Star Wars network. I'm one of your hosts, Pete Fletzer, and I am joined by my good friend, Nick Milkey. Nick, how are things going with you tonight? Everything is fantastic. <laughs> we are here to do another episode of this fantastic interview show that you and I have combined forces on. It's, you know, both of our passion is to interview Star Wars creators, fans, people behind the stuff that we love so much and we were doing that individually and then we got to come together and work on these interviews and conversations and it seemed like we took a good thing and made it even better so i'm excited to do that again tonight uh with you and with our exciting guest awesome well what i will i will let you since you've been going back and forth with our guest trying to find the <laughs> right time for him why don't i let you do a, an intro and then we'll we'll bring him in Absolutely. We are really excited to welcome back again, Kyle Newman. Um, you know, Kyle, he is the director of Fanboys. He directed One Up that came out, I think, in the last year or so. Um, I hope I didn't get that too wrong. But Kyle was on with us several, several months back on a Friday night on the live show. We talked about One Up. We talked about Fanboys. We talked about some of his Star Wars fandom. But we are excited to welcome him back again. We're going to dig into some of those early origins of his but he has a new movie coming out called A Disturbance in the Force, which is a documentary. And I'm such a sucker for documentary. So he's speaking my love language behind the scenes process, all that kind of stuff. But it is about the infamous uh, Star Wars holiday special, the cult favorite. Um, so much good stuff. You and I had the opportunity to watch it um, last night. Thanks to an early you know, link from Kyle. I can't wait to talk about it. I can't wait to hear his stories and kind of the drive and the decision behind making this movie. So without any further ado, it's exciting to welcome back to the show, Kyle Newman. Kyle, thank you so much. How's it going? Hey guys, everybody. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> good to see you again. Excellent. Glad to be back. Always good to see you. Are you recovering from South by? You know, it was a very quick trip, a whirlwind. It was 24 hours. I flew in for the screening. We had a Saturday night opening slot, which was incredible to get picked to mm -hmm. um, kick things off. And I had to fly back out again Sunday because kids, kids. <laughs> and I, I couldn't have asked for Ernie Klein, who, you know, one of the co and Ready Player One. And yep. sleep in a secret room lair. <laughs> At one of his houses, he has like they play player one and 
fanboy, so he's the play. So it was a good walk, walk down memory lane. Fanboy, boys, prop memory. Movie opening was just, just uh, uh. Are we? Uh oh, we may have gotten a little bit of audio clip there. Uh oh. Me okay <laughs> now? I think so. Sounds like it. Um. Technology. We'll jump in. We'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> okay. We definitely want it. We are going to get to the documentary. That's why you're here. That's kind of one of our main focuses we want to talk about tonight. But before we do, in case somebody missed when you're on several months back on that Friday night, let's jump in just for a few minutes. Tell us about your Star Wars origins, where you first saw Star Wars, how it impacted you. And then, of course, if you want to kind of follow that thread to, you know, getting to do fanboys. Star Wars origin. Back in '77, uh, I was uh, uh, 18 months old, old. I think my family took me to it. I don't know if I remember the movie, but I remember it was excited. It was cousins, and we saw Star Wars. And you know, you know of course, we became obsessed ways. And, and my brothers, and they all, all ended up in eventually, but. Back then, hey, hang on one second, and- Kyle. Um, I, I'm gonna jump in here. Let's see if we can do a refresh one more time. I'm only getting about 50% of what we're uh, saying, so yeah, maybe okay. hit us with a refresh and let's see if we can get that a little bit better. Sorry about that. <laughs> Technology, it's out of our hands. What do you think? That's right. Well, to everybody who's watching live, thanks, Matt. Jeff texted me. Yes, we are going to see if we can get Kyle refreshed and get some better audio going on. Um, This is the second time in a row we've had uh, some challenges. I wonder if it's Restream. That's right. Thanks a lot, Restream. Way to go, Restream. Oh, there we go. Let's see. (laughs) Let's try them again here. Is that better? There we go. I think it is better. Let's see. All right. All right. Let's try that. A, let's try that again. Let's right. see um, Star Wars origins and you know, kind of the how where you came to Star Wars and where that took you. You know, from there into fanboys. So I grew up in New Jersey, and mm-hmm. I was very young when Star Wars came out. Maybe a, a year, just over a year and a half. <laughs> and um, the first time I saw it, I don't remember the movie, but I remember the experience of seeing it with relatives at a drive-in theater. And we, uh, I know my family loved it. There was a great energy. My cousins were freaking out. I just remember that it instantly became a part of my youth. And I could pronounce Star Wars names before I could pronounce human <laughs> names. And I was obsessed with action figures. And I can't remember Star Wars not being a part of my life. So basically, I was a Star Wars baby. And mm-hmm. it was, even when people gave up on Star Wars in the 90s, I was, you know, middle school, high school, Lucasfilm. In their newsletters were saying there's no more star wars there was that tragic george lucas yep. letter where he just tried to murder all our hopes and say i'm not doing any more star wars <laughs> i was like you know what it's gonna happen i bet friends i would buy people's star wars collections for like five bucks and for a garbage bag full of toys mm. uh, they're like you're an idiot newman you know uh but whatever i i love star wars and i i you know stayed with it through the novels and the dark horse comics and the eu and everything and eventually i got to make a movie about star wars fans in the form of fanboys and I got to, you know, shoot at Skywalker Ranch and I got to use all the cool IP and it was a dream come true. And I've just always stayed, you know, affiliated with Star Wars as best I could. I got to do some really cool uh, stage shows at Celebration, the uh, mm-hmm. Han Solo Smuggler series with live cast, which featured right. a lot of Rebels and Clone Wars actors. Um, we got the great Warwick Davis in it. And, uh, you know, any way I can, I tried to stay stay active and creative in star wars and just remain a a steadfast fan despite certain you know <laughs> ups and downs and it's sure. great to see star wars living large on the small screen mm. and doing really well i hope it comes back to the big screen and you know it's one of those things it's just i, I can't imagine my life without star wars it, it's so interesting because you know whether it's uh, somebody like yourself who's gone on to become a filmmaker or people like us who who are you know uh, podcasters and content creators or uh, super fans there's something about star wars that just 
has grabbed people and literally like has not let go because as you were saying i mean i saw it when i was seven years old so i'm, I'm clearly a little bit older than you but that 90s time when it was dark and there was mm -hmm. not much going on those of us that still had the action figures you know in plain sight people were they weren't sure about us <laughs> yeah i was driving 45 minutes to go find like galoob micro machine sets remember when those yes. out with the Ralph oh my gosh, it was so good. i was buying the bendums yes. so <laughs> yeah um and and so it made it, it just made sense to me it was always going to come back um mm -hmm. and you know, i just stayed with it and i'm glad to see it did like special edition seeing that in new york city on the zigfeld when those came out with like thousand fans um watching it reemerge from almost cult status into mainstream yep um it's had these major ups and downs and awakenings but i i think it stayed true because of its spiritual core it stayed it, people stayed true to it because it connected on this deeper level because it was this amalgamation of all these other familiar cinematic um genres you know amassed into something totally new um and that breath of fresh air that came i think in 1977 uh it still gives people oxygen and excitement today and that's that's what's so profound about it not many other mm -hmm. movies do that um and it, I think that coincided with a very special time. It was like a time when movies needed it, culture needed it. Yeah. And it was mm -hmm. that perfect storm. And that's probably, again, why it endures beyond what the movie is and what it was technically and creatively. It's that it, it hit at a certain time where people needed it and movies needed it and culture needed it. And that's, that's also a reason why it endures the context of, you know, 1970s and being so original. Yeah, I, I have I have one one quick question regarding you seeing the special editions because you you said you saw it at the Ziegfeld, um, mm -hmm. and it was funny that I that when they came back in ninety seven that was around the time that I was actually doing some work for um, Star Wars Galaxy magazine. Um, and the magazine, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, magazine. Those, those, <laughs> those paper, again? yeah, yeah. Um, and um, but seeing it at the Ziegfeld was I actually took my father because my father took me when I was seven and I took my father to the Ziegfeld to see it and seeing Star Wars again on the big screen was such an important way to see it because, as you said, there are a thousand people in that in that theater. That's a big theater, a beautiful theater. And the experience of movie going that way um, was powerful. It, it, it's not the it's not the thrust of our main conversation, but I want to ask you about your thoughts on Star Wars surviving through disney plus several years past the movies there's probably a movie on the horizon but nobody knows the details of course but what your ha, it can star wars survive in its current environment uh star wars absolutely can survive but mm -hmm. i don't i don't want to see star wars survive <laughs> i want to see star wars thrive yeah i don't want to see star wars get by and be another piece of content that i can choose alongside season nine of whatever or season four <laughs> this or whichever movie they vomit out onto the streaming service i want star wars to be the top tier the upper echelon the pinnacle of my cinematic or television experience and star wars should be there's no reason why the movie shouldn't be the movie event of a year when it comes out there's no reason why the show shouldn't be the ultimate show that also gains fan accolades as well as critical accolades yeah um you know and that's one of those wonderful things that was um incredible about the original trilogy was that they weren't just movies that captured imaginations they were technically innovative and on a story level and on that you know vital vfx technical level george was always pushing the boundaries of cinema and he did that again with the prequel trilogy right and he was blowing people's minds because it was things people hadn't seen before and i think when the dust settled in the prequel trilogy you know now we look back at it, people didn't realize how how innovative they were in terms of model effects and how vast they were in terms of physical mm -hmm. effects they were sold as digital but no one had ever made a movie as big and spectacle as star wars prequels were in terms of the model work and sure. still pushing boundaries and and of course mm -hmm. in the digital and you get to the sequel trilogy and you know there's a lot of hype i like love force awakens there's a lot of hype like we're back to practical effects and you know we're at a celebration they walk a guy on stage and you know one of the denizens of jakku and you're all excited and but that movie wasn't practical effects i mean the whole third act was like a, a cgi cutscene of right. dog fight and it was great but did they change visual effects was it pushing boundaries and everyone i know people are like it doesn't have to i just want a great movie but george was able to make a great movie 
and change the landscape of cinema and push mm-hmm. years and push the technology and bring digital cameras in and digital editing and and character animation and i think star wars when it's when those two things meet and coincide that's when something that's when it's mojo's back and so i'm glad star wars is there i'm glad we're getting these great shows i i, I would love to see the movies come back in a big way and in a way that is innovative and fresh and not just a retread narratively and, and something also that makes people go, you have to get up and you have to go see this in the theater and you have to see it on a big screen. Mm-hmm. You can't settle for streaming at home. Um, so yeah, I, I want Star Wars to go there and I think it can. Obviously, we're 40 something years into this phenomenon mm-hmm. and it's still going strong. And there have been you know, a couple of cinematic setbacks which I think have soured people to it, it changed the way people feel about even toys it changed children's connection with the brand mm-hmm. recently and it doesn't have that same luster that it did which um i think it can easily get back you know with the right care and love and the right people in charge and it feeling like they're doing it for the right reasons without a doubt um i want to hit on something that you mentioned talking about seeing star wars in 77 you know seeing it as a kid seeing it early on Obviously, that was something that was needed in the 70s that, you know, the transitional nature of what George Lucas did, you know, not only from a filmmaking standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, like that was a big, big deal. We have been so blessed over, I mean, honestly, for the last 20 years, really, we have been so blessed with behind the scenes content. And I said in our intro, like, I'm such a sucker for you know, Empire of Dreams, you know, director in the Jedi, like you oh, give yeah. me something that Star Wars behind the scenes and I'm going to eat it up with a spoon. Like I love the technology. We got light and magic last summer and it's all the ILM stuff on Disney Plus, And it's so fascinating. Yeah. Unbelievable. Like all I want to do is have a beer with Phil Tippett and talk to that man <laughs> and hear, you know, his stories and that kind of stuff. But now you have shifted and this is where I kind of transition us is you've shifted into this, the same category. We have this amazing documentary, a disturbance in the force where you dig into all the nuts and bolts, the behind the scenes of one of kind of the great lost cult figures, cult (laughs) status, whatever we want to call it, the holiday special start us out on kind of where this journey started with the holiday special, this project. And then let's just see where we go. Well, you know, I wouldn't even say it's lost. It is lost, but it was more buried than lost. Right. I think people Absolutely. didn't want to talk about it. Right. And I think people wanted us to forget it for a long time. And we're seeing that soften in many ways. Obviously, you see guys mm-hmm. like AJ Abrams and John Favreau citing it and joking about it on red carpets. You've seen uh, talk shows endlessly bring it up. It's the butt of so many jokes. Uh, Disney Plus has finally released uh, Faithful Wookiee onto mm-hmm. uh, Disney Plus streaming. So you can watch the Boba Fett Nirvana animated segment uh, removed from the holiday special. And um, <laughs> interestingly, right? <laughs> it pulled out yeah. on its own. <laughs> you, go to the, you go to a theme park, you go to Disney parks, and not only has Star Wars finally made its presence there uh, strong, but they've actually embraced Life Day. And the, there's Life Day props. There you go. You can you can get all ornaments. And, you know, I remember there was the, the um, Star Wars vault book, which came out years ago. That had you could get in the back of it was a CD which contained Carrie Fisher, the single of Carrie Fisher's yep. song from the end of the film, which was also unprecedented. So gradually you see these little things happen. Gentle Giant put out toys, and um, there's been I wouldn't say the floodgates have opened, but there is a softening of at least addressing aspects of the holiday special. Uh, we got Life Day mentioned in Mandalorian. We've gotten mm-hmm. even a uh, Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. It's gone mainstream. Yep. And, you know, Lego does a, a holiday special. So there's all these things um, percolating. And the Star the Star Wars holiday special, despite people not maybe not wanting to talk about it back in the day, it seems like uh, the that that embargo has been lifted in a sense, but only selectively mm-hmm. by, by Lucasfilm. And so Jeremy Kuhn, who's the director, and Steve Kozak, who's the other director and co-directors, and Jeremy's the editor, um, they set off on this journey to make this film. They'd already begin production and they were interviewing some of the key people. They wanted to really, you know, it's not a hit piece. Let me just say what this is. This is not a hit piece to say Star Wars holiday special is terrible. Right. You can have whatever opinion you want of the Star Wars holiday special. And most people are going to tend towards it's terrible. But this isn't about that. This is about understanding why and how the Star Wars 
holiday special came to be. And it's also establishing a groundwork of, of context. So you can, you can gauge and ascertain what was going on in late 1970s television. Right. In this weird spot between mm -hmm. 1977 Star Wars and 1980 Empire Strikes Back. And it was the Wild West. Thing, anything could happen at that point with Star Wars because it wasn't totally codified. It wasn't totally controlled. George was distracted with Empire Strikes Back. And he wanted to ensure that this became a hit. And his, you know, his future investment empire was going to be uh, an equal smash. And he's putting much of his energy into some books. And obviously, though, this movie that uh, was yeah. looming that he's spending all his own money on. Uh, but he needed to keep Star Wars in the zeitgeist, firmly in the zeitgeist. And, and mm -hmm. one of the things that... There, it was very different than now. And that's what this movie really tries to explore is what, what was television yes. landscape like back then? And what were the outlets to promote a movie? And what was the tone of that? And obviously you've got Bob Hope and Richard Pryor and Lawrence Welk and the Muppets and uh, the Osmonds and all these different venues, uh, variety shows uh, where you could have guest appearances. And so it wasn't like they said, Star Wars, let's make this, this let's invent the variety show format and do, do a Star Wars variety show. It was the way of doing a television show back then um, to get something out quickly uh, without it being like a scripted series. So they kind of plugged into a tried and true, true format. <laughs> and um, and it gets maligned be because people don't, I don't think fully understand the context of what it was trying to emulate or be. And so that's what we really demystify and explore. But through the, through the cast and crew, um, really got, you know, the writers, the director, mm -hmm. the directors, because there was two, um, yeah. one replaced the other. We've got costume designers and the dancers and <laughs> um, the assistant director and everybody we can get that was a part of this thing that touched it. Representatives sure. and liaisons from Lucasfilm. All these people um, came back with very, uh, just, it felt like very present knowledge of it. Like they, mm -hmm. Didn't skip a beat. They had these great right. tales, and Jeremy and Steve tracked them down, and were making a checklist and hit them all off, and getting all these wonderful people. And a lot of them are very older, and some of them aren't with us anymore. And um, Jeremy, who I'd helped produce um, the Raiders, the story of the greatest film film ever told. It was another yep. documentary about the kids who recreated Raiders shot for shot. Um, Jeremy directed that one, and I helped him with that. And he's like, "Hey, man, I know you. I don't want you to love Star Wars, and that's it's like <laughs> thing. Um, you want to help." And I said, absolutely. And I went to Adam F. Goldberg, and Adam was one of the um, writers of Fanboys. And Adam mm -hmm. of Goldberg's fame. Right. Um, we went to college together at NYU. We've known each other for over 25 years. And I was like, Adam, you got to get in on this. And he's been doing a lot of talks about um, pop culture docs. Everything from Ninja Turtles to, you know, the the kids who did a stage play of Alien. Like, it's all the stuff that we all love. You know, he's doing yep. documentaries about all these facet, fascinating things from our our childhood and he was like absolutely so we all joined forces to help them take it to the next level and you know it's just it's a very small core group of us that are just really passionate about it but really as as bad as the holiday special is um <laughs> this is the most palatable way to experience it actually not just experience, it, understand it because right. yes out there on its own watching it on YouTube, it's it's never going to be that that great. But having people Correct. to bring attention to some of the things that are magical or crazy about it beyond what's just sitting there on the, in your little box on YouTube, um, I, I think it's fascinating. And so I was learning so much as I was you know, watching this footage come in and discovering mm -hmm. just you just research to figure out which direction you need to pivot and explore. But uh, like I said, we wanted this to be comprehensive and we wanted to have some dimension to it and you know, one of the guys we got to sit with was J.W. Rensler before he passed yep. away. He passed away almost yes. two months after. And, you know, he's the making of Star Wars mm -hmm. author. He's written great historical, um, you know, tomes on on this franchise we all love. And, and he's shed some great insight. And um, even uh, Gilbert Gottfried, this was the last yes. year. Yeah. You know, yep. provide the funny comedic uh, texture to this mm -hmm. analysis. And But we've had everybody from, like, Seth Green and Weird Al to... You know Paul Shear and talent Karen Killam from Saturday Night Live, and, yep. but that's intermingled with all these these luminaries from Star Wars's uh, what you know TV past. Yeah, I think you you hit on something really important that I'd love to you know pick out for just a minute, which is 
what you've been able to do with this documentary. And like we mentioned at the top of the show, you were nice enough to send Pete and I a link so we could check it out before we got a chance to talk to you. It's unbelievable. Like it's so good. And there's so many things that I took out of it, Hmm. but what you got to do is you were able to really give a wide angle lens to this thing that in a lot of ways has existed in the pop culture zeitgeist as a punchline. Yep. A joke, a, you know, I have two, I have twins that are in ninth grade right now. They're 14 two years ago before COVID hit when they were at school, like their teacher, who's a math teacher, who's a science nerd was like, what do y'all want to watch? And as a joke, one of them was like the star Wars holiday special, like it was a punishment. (laughs) And that's been, you know, kind of this vibe, but to look at it through this lens that you guys have given it, like there's so many layers to it. One of the things that I was endlessly fascinated by was what you said, the time that it was done, not only, George Lucas, but the studio's desire to hopefully keep Star Wars relevant while he's working on Empire. They didn't want people to forget about Star Wars. That's a huge thread line. But the other one was the end of the era of the variety show. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes into that and those synergies of Star Wars popping up on Donnie and Marie, Star Wars popping up, you know, in this two hour special, creating this space for changing eras in entertainment like there's a lot and there. I, th- I think there's a, a an interesting piece related to that is that when you say the studio was afraid that people were going to forget they weren't afraid people were going to forget about star wars but they wanted to keep it top of mind imagine yeah. a time when people had to worry <laughs> about keeping star wars top of mind that's yeah that's that's a a wild a wild concept it was that sure. new yeah. it was that mm-hmm. new and people was it going to disappear the next year was another movie going to come around and eclipse it or steal its thunder uh, were people going to care about Star Wars three years later when the sequel would finally arrive? Was it going to be totally forgotten? Yeah. Um, was it just lightning in a bottle? There's a lot of fear, I think, with George yeah. and Lucasfilm and the investment. And um, there had never been something like this. Yeah. Uh, so you see, you know, Chewbacca with his arm around George uh, with uh, Darth Vader. And they're like yeah. joking. And you can make Darth <laughs> Vader the joke, uh, the butt of these jokes. And that's, you know, stuff that it's crazy to see because you're yeah. like, wow, they let that happen. And you know, everything's so controlled right now. And in a good way, the characters like this is the character and this is the venues in which you can see them. And this is the way they have to be perceived because we're not going to undermine our characters. Um, that those rules, those parameters didn't exist. And there's probably nobody policing them back then for Lucasville. Right. And it was a very nascent company. And this was the wild west. So, that's when the Star Wars holiday special happened. And there's there's just like when, when you do look at it and you look at think about what contributions George made to it. And despite him disowning it and distancing mm-hmm. himself, they set off on a path based on narrative framework put forth by him. Mm-hmm. And obviously it got expanded by CBS who wanted more. They're like, let's make two hours, you know, and they're like, oh, we only have content for one. Like more commercials now, you know. And so of course it gets watered down. Of course everyone's like, we want more, more advertising. Now we can get an extra hour. And you know, he's not in control of that. Right. And the reason, which I firmly believe, is the reason George is the way he is, and the reason he's so hands-on and precious and controlling in a good way about the Star Wars and the direction it goes and the legacy uh, and not doing it in Hollywood, getting notes from a bunch of idiots, is because this thing burned him. Because mm-hmm. not doing that for that period of his life he, he had, here's a final product that he is more or less ashamed of. Hmm. And it's because he couldn't control it to the degree he probably in the rest of his career was able to and yeah. ensure that he could on every project. He's, he's there. I mean, if he's exec producing Indiana Jones, he's not like, yeah, give me the credit. See you. You know, he's there. He's making the movie. Even when it comes to Return of the Jedi, George isn't letting someone go make it. Right. He's coming into the edit room to take over from Mark one and re-edit it and, He wants to be the filmmaker. He just knows how hard production is. But he's there doing it. And there would never be a situation where George lets someone go run off and do whatever they want with Star Wars um, after the holiday special. And it's because this thing was the travesty uh, (laughs) that it ended up. But despite that, there's still, when you watch it, it's 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 fascinating. And there are some cool ideas in it. And they weren't executed well. Um, but there are high points like that, like the Boba Fett cartoon is fantastic. Yes. And there's very forward thinking concepts that feel very George, George Lucas, you know, in terms of as bad as the VR scene is with uh, <laughs> VR 
porn in the living room um, <laughs> yep. on, a kid's, on a kid's holiday special show. Um, the fact that George is thinking like in terms of VR years before all this mm-hmm. stuff, before right. um, even decades before Ready Player One or anything like that, it's 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 pretty cool. And his commitment to taking um, Wookiees, you know, something who's fascinated with it, you know, the Return of the Jedi was always supposed to be Wookiees at the end and not right. yes. sorry, Ewoks, but, you know, Chewbacca became so so beloved and and capable with technology, it kind of neutered the idea of it and he had to find something else, but domesticating, and this he domesticates the Wookiees and he wants to show you life inside an alien family. Right. And he wanted it to just be Wookiees mumbling and and not necessarily having a, a robot there to translate and he i think he really liked this idea of putting it into an alien space you know there's those writers right. that did uh, underworld star wars underworld and mm-hmm. the fact that, that was going to happen i remember they came out and they were like it was crazy they said george this george lucas told us you know han solo was um raised by wookies remember that story <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. yeah. like tarzan raised by wookies and then in this a story came out where they're like George had told him that um, Han Solo was at one point married to a Wookiee. Right. And you're like, wait, what? Yes. And this all starts to make <laughs> sense that, like, George was like, yeah, you know, Han was raised by Wookiees. He probably had this affinity for Wookiees. And this start, the, this this Star Wars we never really saw starts to make sense that, yeah, this probably did tell people that. He probably did at one point see Han as this, you know, crash landed refugee on a Wookiee planet or something that is yep. just raised and speaks, you know, Kashyyyk or whatever the, the official language of what is the language of Wookiee? I've forgotten this now. <laughs> it's Shiruk. Yeah, Shiruk. Yeah. Yeah. Shiruk. Yeah. yeah um, something like that. I can't pronounce it. Yeah, I, I, will. I know it's, it when I see it. You know, I see it in spelling <laughs> in some of these exactly. novels. Yeah. Um, so, it all makes sense, yeah. You know? I, and so, for those reasons, it starts tying these things together. And mm-hmm. um, you know, let's just stop for a second and go. We have to see Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, Peter Mayhew, Harrison Ford, Anthony Daniels. All these guys, uh, Kenny Baker, are back playing these characters, right? And no one really watches it or talks about it. Like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. you know. Is it really that bad? And that's up for you to decide. But I, I think it's a cool. You watch the holiday special, then you watch this. Maybe that's a great double feature. <laughs> if you never watch the holiday special, you just watch this, and you get enough. You get your fix. Um, yeah. But you know, the movie isn't done. That's the thing. The, ver- the version I sent you and the version that screened at South by Southwest, mm-hmm. we sent an early copy. It got in. And we're still not done. We have more people to interview. And the exploration isn't totally done. It's very close. It's going to be very, very close to what you see. Sure. But um, yeah, there's there's definitely some more interesting things that we need to put in that are going to make the movie even better, and the movie will be tighter and more refined. And you know, it's not the final post produced version of the film, but you got sure. to see a very you know far along. I think it was like eighty Absolutely. something minute, eighty eight minutes. You know, it might end up being like ninety two minutes with, with these additional interviews. Well, so and, you need a couple podcasters that you want to get their <laughs> point of view from the generation. You know what? Like, uh, it's 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 so cool that like when you bring up. The holiday special, so many people have some type of stigmatic response to it. Yeah. Um, they remember they they have their, their worst scene or they're like, oh my God, I watched it. I got the bootleg at this place. And right. you know, yep. there's as I see in the chat over here, there's people that you're very familiar with. They got the bootleg. I had to go to New York Comic Con, I think. And it was back when Star Wars was like a joke. <laughs> um, um again, early nineties. And I asked, some guy was like asked me about my Star Wars stuff. It was the Trek table. Yeah, I was like, oh boy. Um, yes, so I, you know, I asked about Star Wars stuff, and underneath the table, he had this box, this brown box, and it was like he had holiday special. I was like, you, wait, what? You have like what? I want to buy that. So I got this VHS of the holiday special. It was terrible, like quality. And then a few years later, yeah. at the Jersey Shore at the Boardwalk, some guy was like, had it also in like one of these weird little shops. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I got that version because I want to see yep. it. And then Ernie Klein brought a version of it when we were mixing fanboys. He got a good high res version, which was even better. And that was on like a DVD. And so you kept upgrading our copies, everyone seeking the finest quality. Yep. <laughs> and what you see in the movie is like a, an AI up version of it. So okay. the clips mm-hmm. we're seeing are better than anyone's ever seen. Them. It's from the best yeah. version ever. And again, cleaned up. So when you see it on the big screen, it actually holds up. It's mm-hmm. not disintegrating in quality like a lot of these things are. Um, 
there's a moment in I think in the movie too where they talk about you know there's someone that YouTube subtitled the Wookiees and we show that clip and he's serious right. serious step down in quality between what we've got and what like a YouTube clip looks like. Um, so for even that reason, it's cool. And you know, I, I don't think the movie's it doesn't have a mean bone in it. Really no, it just, doesn't. And there's there's a couple of things about it that I love. First of all, talking about the when Weird Al talks about it as um, as having a copy is sort of the a currency, right? Uh, that yeah. you can uh, that sh- sort of shows your your geek cred. I actually got my copy directly from the the great collector Steve Sansweet. I uh, oh, yeah. I, I used to I used to do some work with him through Star Wars Galaxy, and my parents very short version of a long story they created a science fiction horror trivia game and he said i will trade you a copy of the holiday special for that game and so i gave him a copy of the game a couple weeks later i got a videotape that said star wars holiday not so special and it was from steve sansweet and popped it in and was like yep this is a this is what i'd heard and it's funny because there's two things that i want to bring up because i think it's really an interesting concept that is part of your film whether intentionally or not, it was one of the things that I took from it is um, first of all, the concept that, yeah, I, we all have a memory of it, that it was really horrible. But when I was eight years old and I watched it, I probably didn't hate it as much as I thought I did. Right. Because I was eight years old. So I got Wookiees. I got to your point, Mark Hamill, the the droids were in it. Vader was in it. We had all the stuff. Um, But what I love, I think my biggest takeaway from from uh, a disturbance in the force is it's also a love letter to fans at that time people yeah. who were that first generation of yep. star wars fans what it meant to be a fan at that time because to your point it was a time when we didn't know what was coming were we going to get more star wars did we we'd heard rumors about the the sequel but this was a strange time tell me a little bit about those conversations that you had with like weird al and and kevin smith and and their feelings that they brought to the conversation you know those guys all obviously they're legit fans they're people who, sure. whose lives have been transformed by star wars and that's indisputable and so hearing from guys like that about just how you know, everyone had that same experience you know i was too little to really remember it i and I knew about it shortly after. I mean, my siblings watched it or something and told me when I was a little bit older, five or six, but I never really got to see it. But I know for the people then, they all had a memory of experiencing it. And so while their memories were very different, it was all like this experience of, oh my God, Star Wars is going to be on TV. I got to click whatever. Nothing's going to get in the way of me seeing this. And then they see it. And then it's like, uh, huh. So there's probably part of them, like like you know, like you said, that that cherished seeing classic characters, these characters they love that just blew their minds, like the previous year. Um, that they don't even have act- that just getting action figures of, you know, uh, on on TV. And there's all this hype about another movie coming, so it fills the gap. But there's also something that's like, that's not the movie. You know, they all had the same, and they didn't know each other. And these people, and they all grew up in different parts of the world and country. And but everyone seemed to have that same type of like, yes, it's cool, but I'm a little let down. But they were kids, so mm-hmm. they were more forgiving. And um, I think when people watch it now, it's, the context has already changed. You're already like, sure. it's awful. I'm going to watch this thing. It's awful, and I'm not. You can't see the good in it. And. Right. There is no good in it on a filmic level. There's no good in it in like, oh my God, that scene was really well done. You know, <laughs> it's not, nothing's great, but there are elements of it. Like the idea of like, wow, more Mark Hamill and he's talking to a Wookiee family. Like, that's kind of cool. Even though the scene's not great, there's something interesting about it. And that's what's good is that it was combinations that you don't see and you never experienced before and you never probably will again. So the execution wasn't there, but it's one of those things you kind of have to see it to believe it, you know? So maybe just going with an open mind if you ever do watch it and, you know, don't go, you know, obviously it's not the highest quality filmmaking, but um, just experience in that way, like without the judgment. And it does definitely bring you back to that time. And it, it, I mean, for my 10 year old to watch it, which he hasn't, because I, I don't want to ruin him yet, but he's, <laughs> but for him to watch it, to be able to, when he's older, and I think for, maybe this might be a great experience for sort of that, that, um, that sort of Gen Z fan, right? Who's a big fan. They, but they've, they've gotten it through sequels and prequels and, and, and television to 
it's a time capsule from that perspective of yes. this is this is the way like to your to the point i think donny osmond uh donny osmond on the on the documentary talking about how we just did this stuff and we kind of forgot about it. it was, these were one-offs. These were, these were the way you did things and to be able to show that. And, you know, you go and you watch, you watch, I, one of my favorite things we watch, uh, the buzzer channel, now the, the old game shows a match game and dating game and all this. It's so funny because it really pulls you to that moment. And that's what the star Wars uh, holiday special did. It pulls you into that moment. And with the star Wars perspective. And again, that first generation of fans, that's how that was a major moment for them. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was something congruent with all these guys and they were all like a little older than me. And yeah, you know, the weird guys, Kevin Smith and, mm -hmm. and those guys like, you know, Paul Shear who tracked yep. it down. And so everybody had that entry point, but a comparable experience with it. Yeah. It's really powerful. And I think Pete hit the nail on the head. It's that time capsule for, you know, certainly fan between the three of us, I was born in 78. So I was just, you know, a little bit behind it. But same thing, like I was aware of it by the time I'm getting to Return of the Jedi, like there's this other thing that's floating out there. I go through the 90s, the dark periods, you know, the in between the old EU and it's this thing floating in the ether. But then I also see people I admire. I love Paul Shear. I love Paul from a lot of his different work. And I, when he showed up on the screen, when Taryn showed up on the screen, I'm like, oh, these are people I love and follow and admire. And they love the same thing I do. Like it's a connecting point. But the other thing that I really thought was special about it was, and you hinted at this a little bit, and Pete talked about it too, the lost voices, the folks that we've lost since this movie yeah. has come out, Jonathan Rensler for sure, Gilbert Gottfried, like the power that y'all had to be able to talk to those folks and hear their stories and hear their voices that were connected to this thing. That had to have felt like something else that was important, even in the moment, not knowing you were going to lose them but these are key voices in Star Wars and key voices Super in important. fandoms. Like seeing, you know, Bob Mackie, the legendary costume designer. Bob Mackie, absolutely. That stuff was great because, you know, Huge. he's got all these drawings and he's, he brings them out. He's proud of them. And, he's and freaking he, Barbie he, and he's connected to Star Wars and celebrities. Yeah, and he brings out these colorful drawings and he's yeah. still there in his, in his creative, you know, office where he's, you know, seemingly still creating all the stuff. And he, he, he speaks about it in a very present and passionate way and it was a, an interesting point in his life and he's a legendary you know costume guy from television 70s and 80s and you know it's like it wasn't like yeah i kind of don't remember i don't care he right. pulls out from his archive all these things he did and there was like uh there's something proud about it these people didn't know like collectively they did their job as best they could they didn't know it was gonna end up like you know when we get to the Jefferson Starship, they talk about that. <laughs> oh my gosh! They're making this, knew yeah. what the hell they were doing. Right. Um, they're like, go in this room, pick out some clothes, look like a space person. You know, you're like, yeah. okay, we're just we're dressing ourselves for Star Wars. Like, what's happening here? That's the mm -hmm. you know, and like, you go with it. All right, and then you see it put together, and uh, what happened? You know, that it's just <laughs> like it's mind blowing that like. Uh, it was. It feels like there was some level of a sleep at the wheel, but then you realize, you know, miscommunications, the wrong people in charge, the wrong format, and this crazy time when, you know, Star Wars wasn't regulated, and all those things coalesce into more or less a, a fascinating disaster. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'd love to hit on one thing that you just kind yeah. of you touched on a little bit. Every single person that's on this show, whether it or on this movie, whether it's the fans, the Kevin Smiths, the Paul Shears, the people who experienced it the way we did, they weren't involved with it at the time. But then you've got Bruce Valanche. You've got, you know, I mean, we haven't even mentioned B. Arthur. B. Arthur's in this thing. What the <laughs> hell? Um, the cost of every single person who was involved with the making of this, and this stood out to me as I watched it, there really wasn't negativity from the people who worked on this. It was a positive thing in the sense of, I'm doing my job. Like, you know, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. We were told we only had this much money and it got spent in the first three days. Like there were all these moments of like the behind the things scenes, things you expect when a project gets made, but overall it wasn't a bunch of people who were beat down by, Oh my God, I have to make this horrible thing. It was, yeah. it's Star Wars and I get to be a part of it. There was hope. Absolutely. Every time you make a movie, you're hopeful that's going to be great. Even if you don't have the resources, even if things aren't lining up the way you want, to make movies, you need to have 
blind and often misguided faith. That's for filmmakers. You got to be freaking crazy. Um, delusional almost. And these people, it's not like any other project. These people all believed, you know, I'm going to go work my 20 hours. We're going to put in this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to work overtime. This thing's got to be working, even though it doesn't look like it's working. We're going to keep going. And there's this, you just have to keep driving forward because you never have the right resources. You never have the right cast. You never have all your crew. Your day never goes the way you planned it. And that is part of filmmaking. You just keep forging ahead and convincing yourself that it's going to all work. Mm-hmm. And all these people come and they commit and they do their job. And like you said, they all were, they seem very positive about it. And, you know, it's cool that you, you look at a magazine like you used to look at Starlog or these old magazines and there'd be these stills. And I was like, I don't remember that from the movie. You know, <laughs> but it was like, there's still from like the cantina in the holiday special. Correct. And this sort of stuff got mixed up. Obviously, there's the famous Snaggletooth, Blue Snaggletooth. Yes. Um, and why he looked the way he did versus, you know, and one of them was like they got a still from the holiday special, and they did it based on that, you know. And that's mm-hmm. that we got two different heights and <laughs> Um, And I used to love things like Cracked magazine. They had a yep. wonderful cover. In, it was like bluish, and it was inside the cantina. And um, I wanted that those action figures when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I just wanted, you know, and some of those creatures were from the from the. Um, Holiday special. I wanted like neighboring leads and I wanted all these things that Kenner never made. Drop the ball. Yes. They've still dropped the ball. <laughs> Not, like, where's the lost line? Like, the 12 figures we should have got. <laughs> right. We all like, want that giant rat that B. Arthur sat down with at the table. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, you know, like CZ3, like all these cool characters, mm-hmm. uh, Tarkin, like all in that, in that kind of look, but as a single wave, you know, that's the stuff we wanted back then. And then there's these cool, so there's all these like, magazine photos and things and sometimes these things would intermingle you'd get like weird photos from the holiday special and it just kept it alive for people yeah and they would still talk about it and i would say the vast majority of star wars fans have never seen it um so maybe november 17th when life day rolls around this is what people will watch you know instead of going to youtube i think this is a better way to to celebrate absolutely yeah 100 it's only done with love and positivity and i think in a lot of ways it absolves george of guilt as it should because it wasn't like he was sitting there on set making this thing and he made something too sure it was out of his control and it got put on a a railroad track that that you know had nothing to do with him and people shoveling shoveling coal into this engine and it's (laughs) barely going to go that direction sure um so it's not his fault but it did he did start the journey (laughs) Right. And, and as you said, at, at a time when that was how you made television, right? You were going to, yeah. it was, he wasn't going to change the way this show was made. I mean, it, it was, again, he was always a uh, an innovative filmmaker, but this was, this was out of his depth. This wasn't his place to play. He was, uh, and, and I think there was the other mention that, you know, this was also right before the first Christmas with Star Wars toys, Donnie Osmond said it yep. got people to go back into the theater. So it worked. It did its job. It 100% did its job. And, and to your point, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's one of those things that, you know, George may not be happy it's out there, but I'm, I'm glad it's there because it does, it says a lot about, um, about, about the time. And as you just said, and I, it's funny you were saying that because I was thinking it as I was watching the, your film, this is a great way to watch it. You get all the elements. <laughs> you don't have to sit through nine full minutes of, of Shri Wook and try to follow what's going on. <laughs> you don't have to watch the uh, the Wookiee porn, but you can get all the, all the great elements. <laughs> and again, I think it does a better job of bringing you back to to that time. What's, yeah. uh, I'm sure after we've just talked about it for 45 minutes, people are going to want to know when and where they may be able to catch it. I know you're in a, in a, uh, in a, an early stage on that, but where, what's, uh, where, what's the options? To, to be honest, we don't, we don't know yet. We, yes. we don't have, um, any, there's, there's no firm plan yet we can talk about in terms of when or where it would sure. be arriving. Um, the goal is obviously the movie's nearly done and it'll be hopefully later this year. And hopefully in time for the most glorious holiday in the universe known as life. <laughs> um, you can wear your red Snuggie and you can uh, yeah. wear a Christmas tree early with Life Day ornaments and pop this on or stream it. That's that's the, <laughs> that's the dream and the plan. Um, there'll be more details very soon about all of that. Um, 
but you know the most important thing is is this like the movie works yes. and the reception has been so warm and positive across the board from really big outlets and, the movie, and it's great hearing that when the movie's not even done you know that's exactly. really rewarding and encouraging it's just like well we know all the, the stuff we need to still do to make this mm -hmm. thing even better so wow like there's stuff that that I, I would love to see yeah like a little bit of the you know the the kenner prototypes for the they planned action yes. figures you know mm -hmm. and there's other ways that the holiday special has been embraced or represented even like star wars.com star wars the star wars show did a mm -hmm. round of time force awakens did their own version of it with like yes. um constable zuvio and things like that so you know there's lots there's so much to mine and it's not like this isn't talked about there's there's a lot of media on it and like i said we have a couple more interviews which are really vital that i think um will help uh add some dimension to certain areas of it as well but the story's not going to change and the tone's not going to change it is what it is and it's got a lot of heart and and um it's got a perspective yeah and um you know so it's it's soon but it's definitely not done and we definitely don't have a uh, a set uh, plan to announce right now, but right. very soon, this hopefully is the year. Awesome. Well, I, I'm sure people will want to follow you so they can hear about when it comes out. So, um, and I, I want to reiterate to your point, it's such an important thing. It's not, there is not a mean bone in the body of this entire thing. It is done That's again. Perfect. This is really a love letter to, like I said, to me, it's a love letter to the fan that the fan that, that, was in that time and a way to share that moment with with people the holiday special as weird and strange and not great as a, a film as it is uh it's important to the fandom and uh it's important that you you captured what you did so where can people follow you and keep up with you so that they can find out exactly when this thing hits well i'm on uh twitter kyle underscore newman and instagram kyle underscore newman and kyle newman fan page on facebook and yeah, we'll be giving updates. Uh, Disturb a disturbance in the force is out there in social media. Um, like I said, our filmmakers are, are Jeremy Kuhn and Steve Kozaks, and um, Adam F. Goldberg is one of our producers. And everybody's out there on the social media. And um, there's the website, you know, disturbance in the force. And um, what is the website actually? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm going to tell it to you right now. Um, because I think that's the best way for people to do it. Hey, you can, um, you can, uh, oh, where are you? Holidayspecialdoc.com. Um, and you can register for uh, updates. Um, and so we'll be constantly giving people information. And if you're in Texas, um, there's still a couple more screenings at South by. And this week, and we're going to be at some festivals coming up soon in, in May. So we'll be giving uh, giving some updates on that festivals timed with a certain special May the fourth. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so we'll be in other places across the country, and so there'll be festival screenings popping up. So there's going to be opportunities to see it even before it's online or or in theaters. Fantastic, perfect. Well, Kyle, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming back and joining us. And uh, you you are welcome anytime to come and talk about any yeah. period of Star Wars you want. And, uh, awesome. and you guys are the best. Us. Thank you. This is so so cool. I love uh, I love just you know talking about this this little sliver of Star Wars mm -hmm. history, and yeah. it's been unmined um, and uncelebrated. You know, well, and it's so neat. And I just thought about this as you were kind of wrapping up a minute ago, and what Pete was talking about, giving not only a window and an insight into fans of our generation, the three of us, you know, that love letter to that, but it also provides a window in the best possible way to newer fans. I've got kids that are 14, 10. We've got friends in the podcasting space that are in their twenties that didn't have a connection. They grew up with the prequels. They grew yeah. up with Clone Wars. They grew up with Rebels. And so to give them another insight into this other part of our Star Wars history, like it's doing that other thing. And like Pete said, in the best way, you get the highlights, you get the fun, you get the story, but you get the humanity behind it. You get the real people who worked on it, not just, oh my God, this is the thing that everybody <laughs> thinks is terrible. Like there were real people behind it. There were real actors, creatives, producers, all the people that are involved in it. Like it gives a, a picture even to multiple generations, not just ours, but to you know newer generations that are still figuring out what Star Wars is. I think that's really special. 
Yeah, thank you. There wouldn't be a, a Lego Star Wars holiday special or a Guardians of the Galaxy holiday yep. special if, if it wasn't for this. So they're standing on the shoulders of a giant. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, of Kyle. Course. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, before we let you go, can I get you to do a, a little audio stinger for us, and maybe say, uh, "Say this is Kevin Newman, and this is this this stuff here." However, however, it feels good for you to say <laughs> uh, this stuff that's on screen here, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, this is Kyle Newman, the director of Fanboys. This is the streaming Star Wars Network. You are listening to Around the Galaxy. Perfect. Love it. Let me just Nailed hit it. end stream here. <laughs> uh, you know, just so you know, it took uh, Seth Green like three tries on, uh, on the, <laughs> the bomb bag cast. So, uh. 